scripture for this morning is from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was attending the, the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light in the, of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. In this passage, we see that the, the true mission of the church begins. Um, in fact, if you, if you have your Bible, you know, you have at, the, at the back there's maps. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of even helpful to see, you know, the, the maps. This would be f Paul's first missionary journey um, is what we're going to be looking at. <clears throat> and there's a shift in the book of Acts from Jerusalem being the center to the ministry of Paul and the church at Antioch being uh, the, the focus. Uh, so this is where the, the, the true mission begins. And I want to see, I want to look at seven foundational principles about things that they did. Um, as we look at the book of Acts and as we look at that as a model to go back to and, and, Lord, and to, to follow the way that the Lord led them. Um, let me get the ones without the blanks to look at. <laughs> um, the first thing we see is the mission was launched among church leaders doing the regular ministry of the church. It was launched among church leaders doing the regular ministry of the church. You know, they didn't get together and say, let's see, let's develop a 10-year plan to reach the world and figure out logistically how we can do it. They were together, they were meeting, they were worshiping the Lord, they were caring for one another, they were doing church, and in the process, the Lord led them to this mission. And a couple of things that we see here is, uh, kind of a side note, is there's a multiracial leadership here that we see. If you look at, if you follow where these people were from, they were all different colors, there was a multiracial aspect. Even in the, in the first church, there was that sense that God isn't racist, okay? <laughs> um, and so we see that there. Um, we, we know that they realized the Great Commission was to, to reach the world. But I imagine that they felt kind of like we might feel if we said, okay, how are we going to do that, God? I don't know about you, but I'm not smart enough to come up with a plan. And I don't think they were either. But they were worshiping God, doing the business of the church, doing the things God had called them to do. And that's when God launched this incredible mission that ended up reaching the whole world for Christ. The second thing that we see 
<clears throat> is that the mission was born out of worship. The mission was born out of worship. Sometimes we have a narrow view of worship. When you think of the word worship, what do you think of? You might think of singing or maybe coming to church, which it would include those things. But it includes essentially everything we do for the Lord. It's our love relationship with Jesus. It's how we show him we love him, and it's that way we fall in love with him. And yes, it's scripture reading and prayer and singing and giving and serving one another and sharing what he's done to a lost world. That's all part of worship. So they were together. They were worshiping the Lord. The focus was on Jesus. And you know, when we really get together with Jesus and we realize how great he is, it should be very natural to want to share that with somebody else. When you experience that love of God that is just overwhelming and that forgiveness that you say, wow, I, I don't deserve this, and yet Jesus gave it to me. And to really, truly feel loved in that act of worship, you really connect with God. It's just really natural to want to share that with other people, to include them in this. And also to see more people glorifying God, because the more, the more people we tell, the more people glorify God the, the more the closer we are to heaven right because in heaven everybody's going to be together glorifying God and so missions are expanded through our love relationship with God not just an intellectual strategy worship should be at the at the center of of everything connection with God and then connecting with with people so that other people can know him in the way that we do. Have you ever met somebody and just when you're around them, there's that sense that you, you feel like you're on holy ground? You feel like, wow, I'm closer to Jesus this moment because I'm, his presence radiates through this person. And you know, that's how it's supposed to be and how it is with each of us to a degree, isn't it? And so that worship just, it's a drawing factor for others. And so the mission, the Great Commission, was born out of worship. The third thing we see here is the Holy Spirit initiated and led the mission. The Holy Spirit initiated and led the mission. He started it and he carried it along. <clears throat> he spoke and they obeyed. Now, we don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit spoke. I mean, curious minds, we want to know, don't we? I want to say, okay, God, how did you tell them to do this? He may have spoken through one of the leaders. Um, he may have just given them that sense. But however he did it, they all knew that he spoke. There wasn't any doubt that he had spoke. And, you know, as we look at the way the Holy Spirit speaks today... When he meets, and there, there's a sense that we know that God's leading us in this direction. God's doing this. It might be one way at one time and another way at a different time, but as we gather and God works through all of us, we get that sense if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, if we're, if we're really seeking to follow Jesus in every aspect of our lives as individuals and, and our life as a church, he'll lead us. You know, we often talk, see people, I'm just seeking God's will. You know, I don't think God wants his will to be all that hard to find. Bonnie talked about playing tricks. God doesn't play tricks on us and say, oh, you know, here, oops, sorry. No, he, he leads us. He wants his will to be clear. Now, he wants us to search it out. Sometimes when it's a little difficult to find, I think it's because we're looking for the end result more than we're looking for Jesus. But, you know, when we really seek Jesus and we seek to have the Holy Spirit direct our lives, he loves to do it for us. He loves to lead us in ways towards him. And, you know, often we talk about Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in churches, and people get a little bit nervous because there are those who, you know, are more emotionalism focused and they're doing a lot and sometimes it even gets a little weird. And so that scares us a little bit. 
But then there are those on the other side who, you know, if the Holy Spirit showed up, they wouldn't even know it. And, you know, it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would lead and direct each one of our lives, that as a church, it would be his work. Uh, you know, the uh, great preacher, A.W. Tozer, and I don't know if you've heard of him, but if you haven't, read, read some of his stuff. He's incredible. But he said something, um, and this was, this was in the early 1960s, okay? Uh, and I think it still applies today. He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and nobody would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. I think that's a good word. You know, we have to be careful that whatever we do is out of a sense of worship. When we have consistory meeting, I, I think that's out of a sense of worship. That's that's what we're doing. We're worshiping Jesus through the business part of the church. And I know it's easy to get sidetracked on, you know, uh, this needs fixed and we need money for that and we have to make this decision about that decision and all those kind of things. But I pray that we never get lost in the weeds on some of those things, that we realize that whatever we do, the way we take care of our building, our property, our ministries, all that is out of a sense of worship. And should be led and directed by the Holy Spirit as he works through each one of us in those spots. Because I don't believe anybody is any, in any of those spots by accident. You know, I believe God is, is at work. And I, I pray that we, we see it that way. That we continually come back to say, Lord, what do you want me to do here? Maybe it seems like a, just a small menial task. But you know, how many times is something like that? really touched somebody's life and honored God. And so, you know, t let's take it back to worship. And let's take it back to really trusting the Holy Spirit to direct us. Because I don't know about you, but I'm just not that smart to be able to figure all that stuff out. And it's, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit works. Um, that... As we're going through things as a church, the book of Acts seems to, in many ways, be speaking to what we're going through. You know, I, I don't even want to try to take credit for that because it just looked like a good, you know, I felt a sense that God was leading us here. I couldn't arrange it, so this sermon comes that day, you know. God does those things. And, you know, often Beth will plan music, you know, months ahead of when we're going to do it. And at that time, I don't even know what I'm going to preach on at that particular day. And yet it fits. And I believe that's God's work among us. And I, I pray that we'll continue to trust him to do that. Because like I said, I'm not that smart. I can't figure it out all myself that way. But God works in us and among us and makes his word come alive to us in our present situation. The fourth thing I, I see here is that the church owned the mission and trusted God in it. The church owned the mission and trusted God in it. You know, we see that they were sent out, but they laid their hands on them, symbolizing that they are part of us. We're going to pray for them. We're going to commit them to this mission, but they are still us. They are just over here. <clears throat> Often today what we do with missions is we kind of like, okay, go do your thing and we'll still do our thing. And there's not that, there's not that connection. Um, the church at Antioch viewed themselves as active participants in the mission. They didn't forget about them. This was their ministry, which was shown primarily in, in prayer and financial support. But there was also a connection that they, they kept in touch of what was going on. And between missionary journeys, they go back to Antioch because it's the, it's the center. It's the hub of the ministry there because it's the church's ministry. And, you know, something else neat about this. They, they looked at it as part of their ministry, but they trusted God in it. They trusted that. Saul and Barnabas were going to do what God led them to do. And so they didn't have to send back to Antioch 
to make sure that a committee approved going here or there, they knew God was leading it, and so they, they turned it over to them. Um, they trusted God, and it does take faith to trust God in, in these ways. Um, so they were connected, and yet they, when they gave something, they let it in God's hands. Um, I was reading uh, this week a passage that uh, Pastor Rick Warren writes, and uh, he talks about when he started the church that he's pastoring, he had the committee of one approach. He said if somebody had a vision for something in the church, they had a particular ministry that they thought would really work well, he said, okay, we're going to appoint you as a committee of one. Pray about it, seek God about it, and go do it. And obviously, still connected and reporting back to the leadership. But that's essentially what happened here. Antioch uh, appointed a committee through the Holy Spirit, a committee of two. Paul and Barnabas, go do your stuff. Go do your ministry. We'll fund you, we'll pray for you, we'll work with you, but we trust you to do what God wants you to do. It's so efficient that way, isn't it? And, you know, often I think part of it's because it might be a little scary to trust God. Somebody else might not do something the way that we would want to. And so we try to manage it. And sometimes what happens is we spend all our, of our energy managing instead of ministering. And the church, the early church didn't, didn't do that. They trusted in God's work uh, among them. The fifth thing we see here is the focus of the ministry or of the mission was to proclaim the word of God to those most ready to hear it. The focus of the mission was to proclaim the word of God to those most ready to hear it. The message of forgiveness through Jesus was always the central message. That's what they talked about. That's what communion is about. That's always the center focus of ministry is that, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? And he forgives me, and he forgives you, and he forgives anyone who will come to him. That's the center focus, and that was the focus for them. But they looked for places where they were already open to that. And I really believe that as long as we're here on this earth, there's going to be people who want to hear about Jesus. They might not know that they want to hear about Jesus. They're looking for love. They're looking for forgiveness. They're looking for somebody who will take the horrible guilt away or the horrible pain away or the horrible fear away. And they're looking for that time when they leave this earth for some faith that there's going to be something good afterwards. I don't think those questions will ever be without need of an answer. And Jesus is the answer. So I think there's always going to be people who are going to be open. There's people around us all the time who I, I believe are ready to hear Jesus, just like there were there. But it makes more sense to go to the people who were most open. You know, why fight fights with people who aren't interested anyways? You know, I, as a young Christian, I used to kind of argue a lot about Jesus, and I could argue that, you know, he was who he said he was. And that was usually with people who all they were more interested or all they were interested in doing is arguing. They weren't really that interested in Jesus. And I don't spend as much time with that anymore. Because there's lots of people that I believe are interested. You know, there's a God shaped hole in each one of us that only He can fill. And. You know, sometimes we're very aware of that, and people are very aware of that. So what they did is they went to the places most open. They went to the Jewish synagogue because the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah. <laughs> and it's kind of like, hey, we, we know who he is. You're looking for a Messiah? Let me tell you about him. And so that was the most open place. Uh, another thing that we see is they went to Cyprus. The hometown of Barnabas. So he already knew some of the people. He would have got a welcome reception. And so they went to people who were most comfortable with them. And even when we see when they're there, this is the first place where Saul is 
changes his name essentially to Paul. He was known both. He had his Hebrew name Saul and his Greek name Paul. And so he's ministering to Sergius, Sergius Paulus, and he says, by the way, my name's Paul too. <laughs> and he goes by Paul after that, the whole way through the book of Acts, we'll see his name now will be Paul. Same person, but he's working among Greeks who would be more familiar and more comfortable with that name, and so he, he does that. So they looked for places where they were already comfortable. Um, you know, sometimes we see movements of the church where people go out and try to knock on doors of people that they've never met before. I don't know about you, but that just scares the life out of me. That is not comfortable at all for me. And I don't know that it would be all that successful most of the time because I know how I feel when somebody knocks on my door when I haven't invited them. It's kind of like... Even if it's somebody I know and wouldn't mind seeing, it's kind of like, well, uh, I'm doing something else, or this isn't a great time. And so why would I want to go do that to people? But instead, I believe that there are people who would love a visit. You know, people who are open. And so we can do that. People who have maybe attended here. People who are friends, neighbors. You know, they're a lot more open, and it's a lot more comfortable for me to talk about Jesus with somebody that I already know and, and help, you know, help them come a step closer. So that, that's the model that they gave us, um, was to start out with people who are more familiar. I, I actually had one guy several years ago, and he was just a brand new Christian, and he came to me and he said, Pastor, I think God wants me to go to the mission field. I said, okay. Um, I said, have you ever, like, told anybody else about Jesus before? Nope. And my counsel to him was, why don't you start here? <laughs> you know, why don't you start here telling the people around you what God's done in your life? And if that really goes well, then maybe God is leading you to the mission field. But, you know, don't just sit here and wait to be sent to people who are so unlike you if you've never told somebody who's like you about Jesus. And often that's kind of the thing that we want to do. We want to, we want to take these great big heroic steps instead of just using the relationships that God's already put into our lives and telling people about Jesus. The mission starts there. Number six, God's mission will always encounter spiritual warfare. Resistance of some sort. And you know, we don't really like to hear that, <laughs> do we? We don't really like to hear that it's a battle, but it is a battle. We have an enemy, and he doesn't really want Jesus to be glorified in anybody's life. And so things are going to happen. There are going to be challenges. There are going to be things, times when... The ruler of this world wants to keep us down. He wants to knock us out in one way or the other. The good news is Jesus always overcomes because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we never need to be afraid. We might have a few wounds, but you know, Jesus will always prevail. We might have to suffer even a little bit, but we never have to be afraid. Because we know that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we look at Paul and Barnabas. And as we'll see, you know, they didn't always have a great reception. Sometimes they got kicked out of cities, left for dead. Here what we see happened is there's a false prophet named Bar-Jesus who was attending the proconsul. So this false prophet is in... Sergius Paulus's ear saying, you know, don't listen to these guys, don't listen to them. And I don't know what else he was telling them, but he's saying, don't listen to them. So they got opposition. Now, what did they do? You think Paul and Barnabas were afraid of this sorcerer? No, not at all. Paul told him, 
he looked at him and he was, said, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked at Elymas and said, you are a child of the devil. Well, that kind of sounds mean. That's not politically correct, is it? <laughs> You're a child of the devil. And an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and mockery. Will you ever stop per perverting the right ways of the Lord? Pretty harsh statement, but a true statement. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of sun. That's what Paul proclaims to this false prophet. Pretty serious, but you know what I see here, though? It looks a little familiar. It's kind of like, hey, haven't we seen this story before? If you go back to, like, chapter 9, when Saul is out killing Christians, he meets Jesus, and what happens? He's blind for a time because he was going the wrong way, and God caught his attention. And Paul's probably saying, hey, this worked for me. It woke me up. And so even this judgment that he is through God laying on this false prophet, the goal of it is for him to be able to see. Now, Luke doesn't tell us whether what happened after that, other than he was blind for a while, because the mission is what he's focusing on. And what we see is that even though Elymas was trying to keep Sergius Paulus away from knowing Jesus, when Sergius Paulus sees this, he says, whoa, <laughs> and becomes a follower of Christ. Because he sees that there's power. There's power. And you know, I, I really believe when people see you and I go through life and follow Jesus and get knocked down sometimes and keep going and get back up and say, I'm not changing my goal. They look at us and they say, you know what? If Jesus can give that kind of strength, I think I need him. I think I need him. Because, you know, I might suffer too, and I don't know if I'll be able to get back up. So they look at you, and they look at me. And overcoming the spiritual warfare furthers the ministry, furthers the mission. And that's what happened here. And we'll see that this, this happens over and over in the book of Acts. But don't be surprised when things don't just go all perfectly peaceful all the time. You know, we do have an enemy, and we don't want to give him too much credit, but we also don't want to forget that he's there. Then finally, number seven, God's mission always results in changed lives. You know, this wasn't to make Paul look great, or Barnabas look great, or the church in Antioch look great, or so they could, you know, count how many numbers and make themselves feel good. It was all about bringing people to Jesus, expanding the, the ministry of the gospel of, of Christ. And we see this in two ways. The first way is through conversions, spiritual fruit, people who come to Jesus, receive him as their Lord and Savior. That's one way that we see this continue to happen. And just about every passage in the book of Acts, you see, and many came to the Lord and many believed because of this. Um, the second thing that we see is in the process, we see the discipleship of believers. We see people grow and become more and more like Christ. If When we look about the, uh, at these other leaders at the church of Antioch, I bet when Paul and Barnabas went out of town, they had to step up, right? Somebody had to fill that spot. Have you ever had to fill a spot like that when somebody, you say, well, I don't know that if I could do that. But sometimes it's necessary and you step up to that spot and you can do it by God's grace always. And so I imagine that these other leaders took a greater role in the church of Antioch and, and continued to grow and brought others in. And so everybody grew up the kind of the leadership ladder of doing more and more and having more and more maturity and faith. Um, so we see that in the, in the church in Antioch. But you know, there's somebody else in this passage who's interesting. Let me see if I can um, get far enough to see it and read it. 
Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter, that's why. Oh, it says, this is in verse 5. It says, um, when they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. It just kind of shows up. You don't think too much about it, but this is John, and he's also known as Mark. So it's John Mark. And we say, okay, this is just somebody who was there helping them. But you know what? We find that John Mark grew and grew in Christ, and in fact, he's the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. So their helper becomes a Gospel writer through the ministry. And so when God does something, we grow deeper as well as wider, you know? We grow deeper in Christ and deeper in our knowledge of him, and we see this helper become a Gospel writer and a a minister for Christ but we also see more and more and more people believe. And that's the way that God's work is. There's always fruit. There's always changed lives. <clears throat> and you know, God continues to change our life. Um, no matter how long you're a Christian, we continue to grow until we meet Jesus face to face. We never get done, do we? We never get completely done. And the times we think that I'm doing pretty well, God shows us, hey, This area here, you could grow quite a bit in. Why don't you step it up over here? And we grow some more. That's the way the Christian life is. And hopefully and prayerfully, the longer we live, the bigger vision of Jesus that we're going to see. So God's mission always results in changed lives. Changed lives of those who have not yet believed, but then also changed lives for us. Now, as far as application, how, what do we do with this? Um, I, I just want to encourage us as a church to let's use this as a model. You know, let's look for the Lord to do things among the regular ministry of the church. Let's look for God to show up. Let's continue in our worship and remember that we do everything out of worship. Let's trust the Holy Spirit and let him work among us. Let's trust God for his work as he starts new ministries and as, he, as people are doing ministry for him. Let's trust that God's going to do great things for them and let's pray for them and be connected to them. Let's keep the word of, of God central and the message of Jesus central. And when we encounter spiritual warfare, let's overcome it together through the power of God. And then... Let's look for changed lives and spiritual fruit because that's what God wants to do. Let's pray together. Jesus, we, we come to you and we thank you for this model. Lord, we humbly come to you and, Lord, ask for your grace and your help. Lord, we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to direct us. And, Lord, we thank you for the victory of Jesus and for the grace and life and the joy that you bring. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.